Good morning, everyone. Uh, so could we just ask everyone as usual to mute your audio and visual visual, uh, then we can uh, keep the stream uh, going strong. Uh, all right, so today I wanted to start, we're gonna talk a little bit about some contingency planning steps that we want, might wanna consider. But uh, first I wanted to start with, and maybe Jordi, I could start with you. Um, what uh, has come up over the years in, in many state planning scenarios when you're uh, taking instructions is uh, a client who will come in and they're heavily weighted. And what I mean that is, is that they're heavily weighted with one single asset, for example, an income producing asset and some GICs, having done uh, sort of spent their life uh, focused on trying to uh, uh, create wealth through uh, a rental property or rental building or uh, one single asset. And uh, that always brings with it important challenges with the planning uh, uh, perspective, Jordy, and I'm just wondering if you had some initial observations on how you manage the planning when you uh, get a client who comes into you with that type of scenario. And then secondly, what kind of things do we want to watch out for uh, with the planning when we are uh, we have a heavily weighted uh, state plan with a single uh, related asset? Uh, Jordy, do you mind uh, starting the discussion? Morning. Morning. Um, so a couple of things that come to mind immediately. Uh, one is the impact of income tax on that asset. So if that's a non-liquid asset, um, you know, sorry, I guess illiquid asset, um, then you've got real problems because you're going to trigger, let's assume it's not going to a spouse, it's going to family members, and there, there's a bunch of family members, let's assume that. Um, so we somehow, We've got to create some liquidity somewhere to pay the income tax that's triggered on the uh, on the debt. So that's that's the first issue. And the second issue is, you know, how do we divide up an asset uh, if that's the idea? Um, if that asset again is illiquid, there are significant fundamental problems because uh, you know it, unless they're going to co-own that, unless all the beneficiaries are going to co-own that, and if so, how? Uh, so those are the issues that uh, arise immediately um, uh, when you've got a single sort of asset that's got basically where the, where the wealth is. Uh, and then Susanna, just before you jump in, I think the other element I find is cash flow uh, because these assets tend to be, and it can be as simple as a cottage, uh, but maybe a bit of a family compound, or it can be, a, as I say, a, a, an investment uh, uh, producing asset in the sense of a, income producing through a re rental uh, uh, well we've got a situation where someone dies in COVID and they've got a heavily weighted uh, estate and they haven't thought about it um, they haven't uh, looked at some of the planning tools pre-death uh, and we can get ourselves into a, um, a significant problem in terms of the administration which we'll talk about but what what uh, would we want to um, think about anyway uh, in terms of talking to the client uh, at the outset when they come to see us, uh, and Jordy, you've raised some interesting uh, dilemmas, and I've I've added to it. Susanna, what are some of the things you may want to uh, ask about, uh, and right. sort of talk to the client about considering? Sorry, I think just alternative ways to provide funds to the estate, um, because there's going to be, of course, the deemed disposition on the date of death, and a huge tax liability that comes with that. And having some means by which to fund the estate with perhaps insurance proceeds of some sort or some other creative planning mechanism, I think is important for us to uh, to consider because a very an illiquid asset is just going to cause great concern and difficulty to the estate trustee and expense to the estate, and no one's going to be happy at the end of that. And urgency to liquidate is something that uh, you don't you can't predict. So. Uh, it, it happens that maybe the real estate market flattens out and you're sitting there and you've got to pay out this income tax within 18 months of the date of death approximately. Um, so let's talk about insurance products. And Jordy, maybe you could start with some of the tools that you might consider on the planning stage to use uh, insurance products uh, for your client designations and insurance trust and those kinds of tools. And I know, Susanna, you and I have uh, spent a career uh, arguing over uh, the impact of these documents. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But Jordy, do you have specific tools that you use uh, when when a client comes to you and they have a, let's just call it a, uh, 
a significant insurance portfolio. Uh, but uh, other than that, they've got like the rest of us, you know, income from employment and, uh, but they've got a, a whack of money that'll come when they die. Um, what kind of planning steps do you have and what kind of tools do you have to assist the client with insurance products? And, and maybe you just watch your on mute. That's all. Thank you. Um, okay. So the first thing assumes that they properly considered using insurance, right? So um, your issue about having that one asset sort of thing, if you pair that with some life insurance, obviously that's a, that's a, a great idea. Often people come to you and it's life insurance is not a possibility to solve that problem anymore. Um, but if they plan properly, uh, and um, purchased insurance to help uh, deal with the liquidity issue. Then, um, so there's obviously a couple of, of things. Um, one is uh, a designation, uh, obviously, to a beneficiary of that life insurance. The problem, of course, is that leaves the estate, and it, that doesn't solve the problem that you have an illiquid um, asset. So uh, in that situation, in some ways, um, that might be to just have the life insurance paid into the estate, used for the expenses, and um, and that's what it's for. So that's what it's for. And yes, there's probate tax on that, depending on the amount. There's other ways using a designation to a trustee, for example, um, arguably might work to um, to avoid probate tax on that uh, on that insurance policy, and yet still have it accessible to pay the income tax, although there's uh, issues about that, um, potentially. Um, and so uh, that's really, you know, the strategy that we can use to fund those uh, expenses that Susanna's pointed out. All right, and maybe in a minute, I'll just give you a heads up and let Susanna jump in, but Jordi, just in terms of some precedent tools that you have uh, for declarations and so on that uh, you may want to get you a chance to. But Susanna, can you, uh, talk about the uh, potential contentious issues that uh, that come up. Sure, Ian. We see situations where designations are made on documents and um, then subsequently a designation is made in a will and they're not necessarily aligned. And in those cases, it can be a real issue in terms of determining who the ultimate beneficiary ought to be. And there is the practical reality that the institution with which the last designation on their file is, is going to be in a position where they're prepared to pay the money out to the individual named on that document with them, which may be different than the designated beneficiary in a will. And so it becomes an interpretation issue as to whether or not the designation in the will, if it's subsequent to the designation with the institution, affects that designation, whether it uh, overturns it or changes it or, or, or invalidates it. And in those situations, we see, you know, litigation arise from it because, you know, practically speaking, the, uh, the life insurance company can certainly pay out the money and they feel immune from having any concerns about the, uh, the validity of that. Whereas, you know, otherwise we're going to need a court proceeding trying to prevent them from paying out the money if someone else is making the allegation that they should be entitled pursuant to the terms of the will. All right, so Jordy, uh, from a practical standpoint then, what tools exist on the planning and drafting side uh, with insurance designations? Well, um, what what we have is really, the, the tool we have for, for insurance is a designation, right? That's that's what we have, and that allows the uh, owner to designate a beneficiary or a trustee uh, for a beneficiary uh, with respect to that policy. So what it is is like a mini will for that one asset. And what's common is if you've got you know a single person that you're you want to designate as the beneficiary, that's pretty easy. You can designate the beneficiary in that way. Um, often, what you have though is you have uh, trusts, for example, for minor children, um, and you want that life insurance policy to be dealt with on the same terms as if it fell into the estate, but you don't want it falling into the estate for the life insurance, uh, for, for the probate tax savings. So um, I'm just going to pull up uh, on my screen if I can figure out how to do that. Um, there we go. Uh, give me one moment here. And um, 
So I'll just make this a little bit smaller. Um, so this is uh, an example of our sort of uh, precedent for um, a pretty standard life insurance declaration. So a couple of things that are unique about life insurance designations as opposed to RRSP designations, for example, um, you, you, you have to um, refer to the contract or identify the contract um, for an insurance policy. So um, sometimes with non-insurance products, you can say, you know, all my RSPs, um, and that would cover all your RSPs because it refers to them generally. Um, but life insurance is a little bit different, and what you want to do in that situation is uh, refer to the policy specifically. So here, I typically do a separate designation, a separate document um, for each life insurance policy, and I keep them separate. So I know lots of people like to put it right in the will. Um, I prefer it to be a separate document uh, and then refer to the will. So in this case, we're revoking prior designations, so that would make it the last designation, and then uh, paying it in this example to my spouse. Um, but if my spouse is not alive, Section 193 of the Insurance Act allows you to appoint a trustee. And so I want it paid to Graham and Sarah as the trustees for those proceeds. And I identify them as the insurance trustees. And then I say, look, um, they'll deal with those um, proceeds as a separate insurance trust on the same terms as I've said, as I've provided from the residue of my estate. And if you're using a secondary will, you probably refer to that, but uh, hopefully they're the same, your primary and secondary will residue clauses. Um, and then I just give them whatever powers and uh, other provisions. In, in other words, I'm incorporating um, by reference the provisions of that will. Um, and remember to sign the designation or the declaration second. You want the will in existence first, so there does, it, there, it is important to assign them in a certain order. Um, but that's sort of the typical planning that uh, that I would do where I want, you know, I would put it into the estate. I would just have it flow into the estate, except I, I, I'm concerned about probate tax, and I want to reduce that. Yeah, and Susanna, you can see the... the difficulties that arise if you don't take these measures uh, because the uh, as Jordan earlier stated the insurance proceeds could flow through the estate but in many cases insurance proceeds can be tens and if not hundreds of millions of dollars and uh, and that raises uh, the problem that if careful planning isn't taken and insurance declarations aren't considered then you might be looking at a probate tax on a uh, on a giant asset and of course, the consequent claim against the lawyer for not having planned for that. And that's what we're always living in fear of. Well, that's great. I know we uh, carefully considered this topic before we uh, got on air for. Uh... <laughs> for the rest, I thought we were talking about something else. I know. It just came to me. And I just thought we'd start with it. So... <laughs> so I just wanted to give you a fair warning that you guys pulled that off well. Um... <laughs> Okay, so um, our next topic, uh, just some, a question that's come in, and again, we always have availability on chat, and uh, we've got a couple today, so I'm going to start with one of them right now, and I'll deal with the other one later. Uh, Jordy and Susanna, uh, July 6th is coming in uh, force and effect, so to speak. We'll remember, I think it was March 16th, not that I've forgotten it already, but we'll also may, as litigators and as practicing solicitors, we may remember July 6th because uh, this, as of yesterday, the Attorney General announced that the courts are on a slow path but are on a reopening mode. And um, a variety of courts, I think 54 courts, uh, have been opened to that effect uh, across the province. Uh, that will have a ripple effect on both the litigation practice and in the solicitor's practice. It's going to allow us more access to, of course, uh, the counter staff, as, as it is. Uh, through uh, uh, still pre predominantly through email in the system that they've established, but um, it'll allow us some access to the courts. Uh, so Jordy, can I ask you, uh, we've asked this before, but now that we're at the date, um, I just wanna get your views. Uh, one of the questions is this, is there any further or new thoughts on whether it's an obligation to bring your clients back in to re-sign uh, wills and powers of attorney? Uh, that you've done through the video uh, channels. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think you have an obligation to bring them in uh, if we're talking about that. Um, I, I did have a client uh, who, uh, who I did a video uh, execution counterpart uh, will with, and um, they are coming back in. I just want to, uh, uh, you know, firm it up, I guess. Um, not because of invalidity, but just because of the amount of paper that's involved. Um, and, you know, it's valid and all of that, but they don't love having two giant pieces of, you know, their, their wills, you know, 80 pages long. So from that point of view, um, but I, I think it's valid. I think there's certain red flags that might indicate a better, uh, a, a, a more of a need to have that redone. So if they own property in other jurisdictions, um, you might want to have them redo a will that looks more like a normal will, because, for example, if you're going down to New York State or Montana or something, and you've got bank accounts there or property there, and the will is signed in counterpart and has one signature on one and another on another, but if, if the time comes and you got to show the court in Montana or something, I mean, it's just going to make things a bigger hassle. So it's more about logistics and uh, reducing hassle uh, than anything else. Susanna? Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's going to be a case by case determination. Um, some people are going to say everything's going to be re executed, others may not. Um, my biggest concern is simply, you know, the counter staff, of course, accepting these documents at first instance, and of course, other third parties. As Jordy mentioned, that's going to be the real test to, you know, whether or not we can get these things going the way they intended to or if we're going to hit procedural difficulties and what we do in light of that great well thanks very much i'm, I'm hoping one day we'll have a webinar that says covid's over but uh we're not there yet we just uh, are there from uh, a declaration from the attorney general uh all right so let's go to the topic that we said we'd talk about <laughs> uh, the, <Yeah. laughs> well that may change again uh, so uh, <laughs> The uh, one of the things that uh, Jordy, you and I did a seminar recently on estate freezes uh, with Duff and Phelps and Chris Nobes and his team, um, and uh, they did a fantastic job on the valuation side. And uh, we talked about the solicitor side, and that's on uh, that's available on our webpage and on our YouTube channel as well, if anybody's interested. Uh, but what what came out of that was a, a trend that. Um, I spoke of, and I know uh, anecdotally is a serious trend in the profession, and that's because uh, the Law Society is really paying careful attention to this internally. And that is, is that as a result of COVID, those practitioners that were on the cusp of retirement, and this goes for, of course, uh, account accountant, any prof sole practitioners or small firms, accounting firms as well, but let's talk about lawyers. As a result of that, um, many more solicitors and lawyers are considering retirement. Uh, they're uh, they're going to get hopefully get through or get through part of COVID and they'll have said that's enough I don't need to uh, do this I was going to retire in two years anyway and uh, who needs this headache uh, and that's uh, a statistical reality and so we thought today we would try to revisit some of the important uh, concepts uh, relating to the transition of your practice and uh, succession planning in that context and I know uh, that uh, we have some great resources available to us in this regard. Uh, amongst them, uh, of course, uh, Jordy, you, you're, you're uh, working uh, all the tools in East State, but also uh, the Law Society of Ontario has created some uh, terrific resources. So I wanted to start talking a little bit about that. And um, maybe, Jordy, if you could start with an overview, and uh, between you and Susanna and I, we'll work through some of the actual tangible documents. But give me an overview, and then Susanna as well, um, on uh, transitioning uh, your practices and and I'm focusing obviously on solo and small firm type of practice uh, transitions. Uh, so, uh, Jordy, do you mind uh, starting? Yeah. So, uh, um, obviously, the law study would love us to have uh, proper documents in place to uh, deal with incapacity and death and what happens to the practice. So, um, there's really a couple of key uh, aspects of that. One of the things that the law society is most concerned about is what's going to happen with um, with your trust funds and other property and files uh, that you are holding for clients and the transition from 
uh, you to someone else. And, and so that's the number one thing. And um, obviously, uh, only lawyers can handle trust accounts. So um, the selection of who's going to be the, you know, the executor for those kinds of assets uh, is, or attorney for property um, is crucial that they be a member of the law society. All right, so uh, what tools are we going to have to use, though, to uh, allow for uh, these kinds of transitions? And I'm thinking, uh, let's talk about, generally speaking, Susanna, what kind of sample documents has the Law Society provided and, and what other um, tools do we have to start considering and what kind of clauses we have to consider? So let's start with the type of tools we want to uh, start uh, focusing our practice on. Sure, and, and those really start with the, the power of attorney documents and the wills, because as Jordi said, the key that the Law Society is really concerned with is the authority, the proper authority of someone to become a substitute decision maker or someone to become the administrator of an estate. And so the Law Society has put together a precedent continuing power of attorney for property for your general assets and a precedent continuing power of attorney for your law practice. Um, and you can imagine and, and I think understand why there would be a distinction between the two and particularly important because if you've got a power of attorney for your practice with someone, uh, they call it a replacement lawyer becoming your substitute decision maker in the event that something happens to you, that individual is going to have authority over all of your law practice assets. And if you, all your other assets would be part of a power of attorney for your general estate, which would normally have a family member or a spouse as uh, the attorney. So it breaks up the two roles based on the two different groups of assets. And then the same happens with the will. You would have a will for your law practice, uh, an executor name for your law practice, and you would have an executor estate trustee for your the rest of your estate and breaking up those two roles, I think helps a lot in terms of management ultimately of both your practice and your personal assets. Okay, so one of us, and I don't know if you, Jordy, are you ready to go to share the screen on some of these samples uh, or do you want me to? Uh, I, I, this is the contingency planning guide. Let me just uh, share that. Give me one moment here and uh, um, and Ian, if you want to sort of lead me through what you'd like to uh, look at. Well, so that's the resource itself. And so uh, this is page resource. eight is page eight is where we'd like to start uh, because that gives us the sample um, uh, power of attorney. Uh, so, Jordy, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, not just the, the document itself, but the context behind it? Right. So again, it's the same issue that you've got to have somebody who has authority who can actually manage your trust accounts and your. So you've got to have somebody who can manage those uh, assets that only a lawyer can manage trust accounts and client files and transitions. Uh, uh, pro client property. Um, so that's what you're doing here and, and you're going to have one for. Uh, for your practice and one for. Uh, you know, your other assets, as Suzanne has pointed out, and this is the one um, that uh, this is excluding the let. So this is the general one that excludes the uh, law practice. Um, and then there's, of course, one that um, this is the power of attorney for the law practice. And this is the definition that uh, the law society has put in for what, what do we mean by law practice? Um, and it should it should also include if you run your practice through a corporation. It shouldn't include that. Um, and uh, so that's that's basically, uh, uh, you know, the definition section. And then you've got the appointment of the of the lawyer, quote, uh, uh, your lawyer attorney. Um, so that's the, that's the point there. And I think that the crucial thing is, is that the, the hard work has been done on some of these key definitions. And if you could just go back to definitions of law practice and corporate, uh, that that's a you know that's a bit of a no-brainer now if if you uh, you can pick and uh, choose your language but um, you've uh, a lot of uh, smarter people than I sat and played with this language and um, so it's got a lot of strength behind it and uh, it cuts a lot of time down in terms of you know one of the excuses in this is that who wants to spend time doing this and certainly we're all struggling with finding time in COVID uh, for these sorts of considerations and. Uh, I, I just commend the uh, the definitions because uh, 
the committee that sat on this uh, spent a lot of hours working through this and considering all of the language that they could consider and the uh, law practice uh, corporate properties one is especially important when uh, many of us operate uh, with a professional corporation. So um, the, the methodology is there as well, the finding of the, the appointing of the first replacement lawyer and the replacement lawyer itself. Finding a replacement lawyer in, in smaller communities can be a challenge, uh, but uh, the more we start thinking about it, the earlier we're gonna be able to uh, look to a solution. So the next document um, uh, is the, if you scroll down, Jordy, is the, um, uh, the direction, um, sorry, just if you just went past it. Yeah. Uh, the release of the power of attorney for property. For, now, this is a tool that uh, we haven't talked a lot about and we, we should spend a few minutes on. Generally speaking with planning as a, a role, as, as a whole, some lawyers uh, have directions for the release of their powers of attorney. So let's maybe talk about that and then talk about the specifics of this in respect of uh, contingency planning. So Jordy, do you mind starting that? And then Susanna, you can make your comments. So um, I, I like to have an escrow, a, a, what I call an escrow agreement or a sample di or a direction for the release of any power of attorney that you're, that I'm holding um, for a client. So, uh, because if I, if a client gives me the power of the original powers of attorney for property, for example, to hold in, a, in my safekeeping, uh, I, I need to know when I can release those. So, um, you know, if the attorney just comes and asks me, can I give it to them? If one of three had asked me, can I give it to them? On what terms can I give it to them? And that's what these directions uh, deal with. Um, and I would certainly uh, recommend that if you are holding a, re we all know when to release the will, um, it, you need a death certificate. It's much trickier with um, the uh, power of attorney. Of course. So that's why it's a good idea to have something like this and um, either you know, specifying you know, is it just written evidence or written requests by the attorney? Uh, do I need to check with you? Uh, do I need some sort of medical evidence? Um, on what what terms? And the client can pick those and tell you what they what they want, uh, what the rules should be for when you can release. And they've got uh, in this sample uh, three options. And Susanna, do you uh, want to speak to some of the? Um, concerns that arise uh, in a contentious release uh, situation? Sure. Yeah. Um, the question, of course, is, you know, is it the time and is it the right time to release the document? And having an escrow agreement, as Jordan refers to it, with clear guidance to the lawyer who's holding it helps a lot. And these three suggestions here by the Law Society, where it's the actual uh, individual who's created the power of attorney on their written um, notification, it can be released if maybe that power of attorney document is gonna be used during a period of capacity, but maybe an absence by a lawyer who's uh, prepared the power of attorney. It could be on the written confirmation of a qualified medical doctor. So you've put in that test that it's gotta be a medical determination. And the last one, uh, a sworn statement. And I think this was a good catch all one because it's a sworn statement by the replacement lawyer who's saying that notwithstanding their very best efforts, they couldn't get a written uh, release uh, direction from the planning lawyer, or they couldn't get the medical evidence, but maybe because of some kind of urgency, it would be in the best interests of the incapable person for that document to be released. And that kind of direction gives a lot of comfort to the lawyer to be able to release the document and not have people come and say that it shouldn't have been done and being criticized for perhaps having released it prematurely. Yeah, and I, you know, just having been on the committee that was involved in this, I, I want to say loud and clear that this was written by lawyers, not for the law society, but for lawyers. And this last uh, term with re regard to the release was heavily debated and one that um, I think is, uh, is, is well drafted, but also gives, uh, makes a lot of good sense. Uh, the law society, I know, are anxious not to be stuck with trust account problems or administration of practice problems, and that's an obvious uh, concern. And, and obviously, uh, as, as professionals, we owe an obligation to make sure that we have that under control. But um, uh, I just thought this was a, a really well, uh, as you've described, that a well drift drafted, not that I did it, but others smarter than me did it to uh, consider this variable. Um, <clears throat> Jordy, can I just ask you one question in your practice? 
Is it one or two doctors? Is it three doctors? Is it eight doctors? What's your thought? Yeah, there's a couple places where the doctors might come in. In this escrow agreement, um, what I typically say, and, and you can see what they've done here, they haven't said that you know, the doctor has to find the person incapable of managing property, which of course is a, a legal test that doctors don't want to be involved in. And so um, that's why they talk about, you know, some evidence that's unwise for the, for the, the grantor to be, to continue to independently handle their own affairs. That's, that's, that's the kind of softer test that we're using for the release of the power of attorney. Um, so typically, yeah, I would, I would be comfortable with one doctor uh, doing that. The, the other place that you see it is in a power of attorney for personal care, where if there's a dispute about the person's capacity to make personal care decisions, um, you have sort of some people like one doctor making that determination, other people prefer more than one. Um, and, you know, I mean, typically uh, I would be comfortable with one, but everybody's sort of different and, and clients are different. And so, you know, each person sort of makes their own call on that. Yeah, and, I, and that, that term, it would be unwise for the undersigned to continue to independently handle his or her own financial affairs or words to that effect. Uh, I kept hearing that from my father when I practiced with him. He kept trying to invoke <laughs> that on me. So I, uh, <laughs> it's ringing true to my brain. Um, okay, if we could scroll down to the next uh, document uh, sure. in, the, uh, in the tools, um, only just because you're on the screen. Um, so yeah. this is the, the sample will uh, and testament clauses that... Uh, uh, are, are to be considered, um, and and maybe uh, I'll start with Jordy and and just uh, walk through the thinking in terms of these samples uh, clauses, and more importantly, um, you know it, their application uh, in respect of drafting. Yeah. So the way they they they're dealing with it is considering doing a separate will for your legal practice. Um, it, I know they you know, necessary per se to do that. Um, it may be cleaner, but um, uh, you could put it all in the same will. Um, the key I think here is the appointment of the um, executor. So um, this is really the important part um, where you're uh, appointing a replacement, uh, you're appointing so-and-so so to be a, uh, uh, an executor with respect to the law practice. Um, and whether if you do it in a separate will, sure, you could have it as a separate executor with, in, in that separate will. Um, but it's not uncommon to have just the, the appointment of a special executor, what we would historically have referred to as a literary executor for literary works, but just have a, an executor with respect to the legal practice. Um, and um, so that's what they're, that's really the key element here. Um, all right, so let's just go back and just scroll through some of the clauses, though, that they're uh, they're recommending as well. Obviously, the uh, the general description is important if you're doing it in one or two wills. But the revocation clause, again, uh, the cursed revocation clauses uh, in all drafting with primary and secondary wills or multiple wills. Uh, uh, certainly, Susanna, you've seen it on the contentious side when these things aren't done properly and their impact. Uh, uh, and then maybe you can give some comment on that. And then Jordy, maybe you could talk about uh, what you're watching for when you're drafting your revocation clauses, especially with a scenario where you're drafting it in a multiple will or in here, a, a law practice will. Why don't you start, Jordy? Are you, go ahead, Suzanne. Sorry. No, no, go. <laughs> yeah, I think it, um, the provisions here are really good to to highlight the fact that there is going to be perhaps more than one will and that we want to be careful that we're not inadvertently revoking it. The Law Society is sort of suggesting, not suggesting, but they're, they've uh, t introduced the possibility of two different wills. And so one dealing specifically with the law practice and one dealing with everything else. And if we're doing that and we're also dealing with maybe a multiple will situation with personal assets, you can imagine how easily it could be to get tripped up on this revocation provision. So to the extent that we're being as specific as possible and as mindful uh, of that as we can be, I think is really the key so that we're avoiding these fights that somehow something got revoked inadvertently and that there's no will or proper document governing that asset. Jordy, 
Um, yeah, and, and the idea that you just don't want there to be uh, conflict between those provisions and um, always have to be careful about uh, codicils to uh, multiple wills because of the revocation clause that revokes everything prior. And then how do you, uh, you just have to be careful about that because it would step up the date of the, it would republish the will in a sense. Um, and uh, there's some concern about that, although you don't have any case law on it, but I think a court would, would, would not get too technical on it, but it's still a concern. All right, and I noticed that the law society went to the trouble of uh, including a life insurance clause here uh, on the, with the law practice wills. Um, Jordy, did you have any thoughts on that clause and in particular its use? Yeah, I mean, it's again, it's a question of whether it's owned by the by the practice or not. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure why I would have that unless it's the only time you you use that is if it's owned by the practice. I would think. Um, you know, I'm not sure necessarily why I'd, I'd include this, but so uh, I may, think that the reason. Assist, oh, go ahead, Susan. It, it, it might assist, um, I think, from a liquidity perspective, if someone is coming into the role of an executor, doesn't yet have the authority necessarily to access the bank accounts or the trust accounts or or what have you, not the trust accounts, but certainly the general bank account, if there are expenses and overhead that has to be paid in the meantime, it might be a means by which that funding can happen. And also possibly if there's gonna be a claim for compensation, uh, putting some money into the uh, the practice itself so that there's an ability to satisfy those kinds of expenses. It's a good yeah, point. Yeah, I was also, uh, no, go ahead. Uh, I was just thinking that uh, part of it was too, when we were there drafting this was that um, many practitioners over the years have been smart enough to own their buildings. And like you say, Jordy, the ownership of the, uh, the building may pass with the practice uh, on a sale basis or whatever. And, um, and that was one of the thinkings as well, thinking as well, um, from a, um, all right. So just let me get you, uh, from a practice point of view in view of the death of the lawyer, who does want, who, how does one proceed with the appointment of two different executors or two certificates issues issued? arising from the single will. Jordy, can you talk about that? That's the question that's come up. Yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, you, you typically, what happens is it's a certificate of appointment that has a uh, special provision in it that appoints um, the two executors, but with respect to different assets. Um, and so that's, if you're doing one will, that's how, how you might see it. What if you have two wills? One. Uh, both being public in its sense, because one is a general will, primary will, and then another is a law practice will, uh, which may need uh, probate. Uh, for example, maybe there's real estate to pass or something like that. What does that look like, Jordy, when you apply for probate in that situation? Um, you'd have two certificates in that situation, one with respect to each of the wills. Um, and uh, so that, that's how that's a, a little simpler situation again. That's why. Probably they, they're talking about having two separate wills uh, in, in that, you know, where you have a law firm. Perfect. Okay, uh, can we just scroll down and then just uh, address a couple of other issues in the context of this uh, precedent? Um, from my standpoint, we, I think we've covered the executorship for sure, that being the, uh, the, the primary. Uh, but uh, many practitioners have uh, taken on the role of being executors. And um, uh, the the not just with uh, with the, in this scenario like this, but in any scenario, uh, practitioners need to address that role and what what will come of their uh, title as an executor of one of their clients' estates. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how that's dealt with, uh, Jordy, from a drafting standpoint, and Susanna from a substantive standpoint? Maybe so. Maybe, Jordy. maybe Susanna goes first, just to. Explain the problem. Sure. Um, if there's only one executor and that individual dies, then there's, and the estate has not been administered, there's going to be a devolution of that role of executorship. And normally it would go to the executor of that individual who's passed away. So the, the lawyer is an executor for a client's estate. He passes away or she passes away, then their executor would be picking up that role by devolution at law. And this, uh, what we're seeing here is a, a means by which we're giving some thought to what happens in those cases so that 
we don't necessarily end up giving that role to our spouse inadvertently or someone else inadvertently. Uh, Jordy, did you have anything to add to that? Right. So uh, again, this is like a special executive uh, for that, um, where you can say, okay, if I am a, if my executorship would otherwise devolve to my regular executor, I don't want that, and so I'm going to appoint someone else, uh, a lawyer uh, or somebody who should be, shouldn't be, you know, is willing to be burdened with that uh, to be the executor. So, Jordy, we just been asked this, and uh, uh, the the question is this: um, If you're doing a general will, and then you're also getting probate on a law practice will, uh, how do you go? Do you have to? What do you have to do with the value on the law practice for the uh, application for probate? Well, I would think you. I mean, I haven't done one personally, but I would think you just have to. Same way you would apply, you're applying for limited, uh, basically a limited certificate, right? So. Um, and it's limited to the assets in this will. And so you pay the probate tax on the value of that practice. As far as questioning how to value that practice, uh, that's beyond my expertise by, <laughs> by a long way. But uh, I don't know, maybe you guys have some comments on that. No, uh, the old rule uh, used to be $15 a will. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, that's what we uh, turn those things over to Duff and Phelps and let them figure it out, uh, as we heard in our uh, webinar. Um, we put that directly to the uh, Duff and Phelps and, uh, you know, all of the valuation considerations right now in COVID are upside down for sure. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, I don't think they've even priced in uh, valuations on what we're going to do with all this government debt, but they uh, uh, had some interesting comments about valuations generally. and. Uh, I, uh, it's worth listening to uh, those comments by uh, Duff and Phelps because I thought they were helpful in terms of giving us some sense of what, if any, values our practices have um, at the time of uh, uh, and, and whether you're actively practicing when you're not actively practicing, what goodwill comes with the practice and so forth. Um, Suzanne, I, I know you've uh, you and I have over the years had lots of valuation fights uh, with the help of people like. Uh, Chris and Obes and Dub and Phelps, uh, the valuation fight can be exhausting. Uh, did you have any uh, thoughts on the valuation issues? Uh, nothing more than the, the experts would be able to provide, that's for sure. But uh, you can imagine that just like with anything, if there's going to be one expert, there's always the possibility for a competing expert. And so it's, it's fraught with uh, the opportunity for conflict if there are, you know, just like any experts report, really. Okay, so let's just scroll down. Um, and um, uh, the compensation clause is, uh, is, is, is vital in these scenarios because, of course, with the law practice will, uh, there may be uh, uh, considerable effort being undertaken and uh, whoever's taking over the practice. One of the worst things you can do is create a law practice will and appoint someone who doesn't want to take the job. So. They have to be compensated. Um, so uh, again, uh, Jordy, the definitions here are what I would describe as helpful. Um, scrolling down, we've got definitions of uh, practice law, my law practice estate, corporate properties, general estate. All of those are helpful definitions. You're a big fan of definitions in your wills. Uh, do you have any thoughts or comments on the definitions in this situation? Yeah, and this is this is obviously like a, a typical primary secondary will where you want to make sure the definitions match one another, and you're excluding from one and including the other will, uh, and that's why these definitions are so crucial. Suzanne, I know uh, you and I were involved in a big case years ago on this question of uh, of one will or two wills. Uh, can you just give us some uh, general observations that came out of the captain interpretation case uh, in respect of primary and secondary wills, and is it true that you have, uh, while well, we may have two physical wills, you have two estates? It's, it's a good question. Uh, we've really got a pool of assets, one pool of assets that's governed by two different wills. And so some people will refer to it as a separate estate, having we do it in our definitions, but truthfully, it's just one group of assets. And it's either going to be governed, depending on the nature of those assets, by one document or by another. 
That's a great point. Um, all right. And then they, they went to trouble of vesting clause drafting um, as well. And I think that was just uh, to emphasize the importance of uh, picking up the definitions, Jordy, that you talked about earlier. Um, and, um, and then, of course, uh, the debts clause is important and the law practice will in particular uh, to uh, affect that. Um, uh, the the last point I just want to talk about before we wrap up is this purchase by trustee clause, and um, and Susanna, maybe you could just talk for a minute about self dealing law generally and the restrictions that would typically come about uh, if a if a uh, executor was appointed and was purchasing the uh, asset of the estate. Sure, Ian. We'd want to definitely check the terms of the will to see what it provides for in terms of that kind of a specific transaction. But generally speaking, uh, an executor or a state trustee is a fiduciary and they have to act in the best interest of the, uh, the beneficiaries and can't act in conflict. And when there's a possibility or a consideration of perhaps buying an estate asset um, or transferring it to oneself, the question is, you know, is that a proper transaction? And we would normally say to our clients that, you know, you would need a court, the comfort of a court order to um, to buy an estate asset at fair market value, so that you've got the permission and the authority to do it, and not necessarily or not at all be opened up to criticism. So the whole idea is to make sure that if you are purchasing an estate asset, it's being purchased at fair market value, that you can prove that that's the case, and that you've got the consent of the beneficiaries or an order of the court blessing that in essence. And that is so crucial and it, it, you've got ethical obligations beyond this. Uh, you can't uh, counsel yourself with a breach of trust. You can't self deal. Um, and uh, so uh, while it's not in uh, red ink, uh, this clause here is a crucial clause to include. If it's anticipated that the trustee would be buying the asset, you've essentially contracted out of the self dealing restrictions. And uh, uh, it, it's a vital clause to avoid that application to the court uh, that Susanna's described. Jordi, do you have any thoughts on the uh, purchase by trustee clause? Yeah, because likely that's what's going to happen is the, the best, uh, the, 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 the person who's taking over pr the practice, at least in the short term, is the most likely purchaser here. So uh, that makes very, it's very important to have that. Thought. All right, let's just uh, skim through the last couple of uh, precedents here. The sample practice uh, coverage agreement between the planning lawyer and the replacement lawyer. Um, that's, uh, Jordy, your thoughts on that kind of a, a document and uh, just generally uh, what, what's your view and what, why is that being included here? So again, it's just th this idea of, um, you know, how is the practice going to get run? Um, and, uh, you know, that's what this is about. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, important, uh, obviously, to plan through that to the extent that you can. Um, this is, uh, in, in essence, not just in, ca in capacity issues or debt. This is where you want to sort of, uh, you're planning on selling the, 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 um, uh, your, your uh, uh, practice and you, you want to deal with it, um, uh, that. So that's, uh, that's part of the issue here. I think it's almost like a shareholders agreement that you have to negotiate, but sorry, go ahead, Suzanne. It also gives an opportunity to, for you to really delve into what um, you want to happen to your practice and it becomes a dialogue with a replacement lawyer. You know, is there going to be an expectation or a hope that the, the, the practice will carry on? Is there going to be a uh, consideration of a possible sale or an eventual wind up? And so having this kind of a document gives an opportunity for those thoughts to be had and these discussions to be made and, and then to try to build in planning that would come about in support of any of those decisions ultimately that are going to be made. Yeah, and I think that's the crucial point as we wrap this day, this week's webinar up. Uh, if you're going to enter into this kind of planning, uh, more so than even with beneficiaries in some respects, maybe, uh, you're about to bring a partner into the game and uh, communication discussions uh, that agreement forces that discussion, uh, whether you actually end up signing it or ending up negotiating it out, uh, it may not even matter. You've at least raised it and uh, you've made your wishes clear that, you know, you like to keep the practice uh, uh, doing 10% house calls, uh, something like that. You want to be able to serve the community. You want to, you've got some 
uh, sort of uh, goodwill that you've created that you want to preserve, but more importantly, you want to continue on with access to justice issues. You want to continue with uh, goals of diversity in the firm or something like that. So, so those are the sorts of things that at least you can have those discussions uh, with your uh, transition uh, team. All right. Well, look, it's uh, we're winding up today's, and uh, although uh, next week's uh, topics are, are unknown, uh, I, they will be unknown to you guys as well until I start. So, uh, really appreciate you helping out today, and uh, Suzanne and Jordy, and uh, wish everyone a great uh, long weekend. It sounds like it's going to be a hot one, and we'll uh, we'll carry on. And uh, best of luck to everyone as July sixth opens things up. We'll uh, keep everyone posted. So, thanks very and just much. Just Sorry, yeah. just a quick plug just before you wind up, Ian. Um, for anyone who's interested in this topic, the succession planning, um, my colleague Alexandra Majewski and I did an online course for the Law Society, which if you Google, I'm sure you'll be able to find. And we really delved into a lot of these specifics. We don't have necessarily the precedents. We were working with the precedents that the Law Society had, but certainly a lot of other considerations that you may want to think about. And it did, of course, go beyond just the sole proprietor kind of situation for partnerships and uh, other arrangements. But I throw that out there for anyone who might be interested. Jeez, I'm glad you mentioned that, Sherry, Susanna. I forgot that you do so many, it's hard to keep up. <laughs> um, okay, Jordy, do you have anything else to add? I better, actually, I'm going to end this saying, do you have either of you have anything else to add before we close <laughs> up? Just have a have a great weekend, everyone. Okay, Th thanks so much, Thank everyone. You. Okay, bye bye. Yeah.